My name is Leslie Gould. I'm the very proud executive director of the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome everyone today. I have some housekeeping to do real quick before we start, okay? One, I want to thank the staff of Mission Boat House. Amazing to work with. Amazing. Priscilla and her team are rock star event planners. So thank you for that for them and for all that they've done to help us with this event. I want to thank BevCam, Liz DeFazio. Where are you, Liz? She, BevCam is a sponsor and she's working this event for us. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We will find out when this will be rebroadcast so that you can watch it again. I'm sure you'll want to tape it. But thank you so much. It's so important. Our local media is a valuable resource in our community. I also want to say that right here in this room on September 25th, the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce is hosting a major fundraiser. It is our Mission Underground. It is a night of vintage glamour and high stakes. What does that mean? It's an awesome casino and an auction. So you will be hearing about sponsorship. We will be asking for donations for items. Please consider us. Uh, we are a self-funded nonprofit, and that means that membership investments and all the fundraising that we do help to uh, let us keep going, <laughs> quite frankly. So I also want to thank Karen, our awesome moderator today, and all of our panelists, which I know she's going to introduce. I also want to thank our amazing Power of Women committee. If you are on the committee, uh, Linda is the chair. Please stand up or say hi or do something because you need to be recognized. And not all of you are here today, but one of the things I love about this chamber is how creative and how collaborative everybody is. It is amazing to watch an idea come to reality. It's super fun for me, and I know Kim Carrigan can relate. For me, it's like producing live television. That's how I kind of feel about it, and it's really cool. I want to thank our sponsors who do get an opportunity to come up and say a few words. If you would like to, you do not have to, but our gold sponsors are Coastal Windows and Exteriors, Great Point Wealth Advisors, and Institution for Savings. Would you like to come up and say a few words and welcome? You don't have to, but I know Stephanie will. Come on, Steph. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm super excited to be here. Gold sponsor and a committee member and a women-owned business. Very, very proud of that. And if you didn't get a free bracelet today, it's, there's no charge. Everyone was like, what is this for? We talk about creating your signature style for your home. And I love that. And I'd love to be able to continue to educate. And my first job here is with some of the people that are in this room as a former teacher of the deaf. And education, once a teacher, always a teacher. So super happy. Anyone from Great Point Wealth or Ramirez, you want to say a few words? No, no, no. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Then I just need to thank our uh, other sponsors with my glasses on. Uh, Beth Israel, uh, Leahy Health, Beverly Hospital, and Addison Gilbert Hospital, thank you so much for all you do for us. BevCam, as I mentioned before, Cross Insurance, Eastern Bank, Harbor Light Homes, Turcotte Homes, and Taste Buds Kitchen. And our bronze sponsors are Align for Life Chiropractic, Greater Beverly YMCA, Montserrat College of Art, Seaside Graphics, Specialized Pediatric Eye Care, Children's Center for Communication, Beverly School for the Deaf. And that is another segue. I am very proud. Uh, Karen, stand, where are you, Karen? Can Karen, where is she? Karen, come on, stand. Karen Hopkins is the new CEO of the Children's Center for Communication, Beverly School for the Deaf. She is hard of hearing, and she came to me and asked if we can have interpreters here for her. She can read lips, but not in a large crowd. And I said, that is like the coolest request I think I've ever had. So I want us as a chamber to embrace this concept. I want us to think progressively. It's never happened in the 26 years that I've been a chamber director that anybody's even asked me for that. And to me, it's a human right. So I am so excited. They're going to come up and they're going to sign uh, for her so that she can be a participant like all of you today. So with further ado, thank you so much. Thank you. A thousand percent. Without further ado, Karen Ness and Benny, our awesome moderator. Thank you. 
And Karen and I met um, when I was on the book tour with Donato Tremuto, the leadership book, Compassionate Leadership. So we go back a few months to a year now, and I'm so happy to have you here back in the community. This is really special. All right, so I'm Karen Nassimini. I'm the GM of North Shore Music Theater. For those of you who don't know me, we have a really amazing panel today. Um, I've done this several times, and the funny thing is there's always a commonality. Like the first time I did this, we were over at, um, what's the Yacht Club down here? Uh, Jubilee. And all of us on the panel had some major medical thing that changed our career. It was so weird. And then the next time, I think when we were on stage at North Shore, everybody had, was in business with their husband, and we kind of actually didn't even realize that in the beginning. There isn't a strong commonality today, but maybe between like two and two, but by the end of this conversation, we're going to see, there's usually some kind of a thread. Um, this will not be, I'm not gonna read everybody's bios. I'm going to talk a little bit about them as I'm interviewing them and asking them questions, so you'll learn about them that way. Um, and it's going to be a conversation. So at any point, if Linda is saying something and it relates to what Kim is um, feeling, they're gonna jump in and that's where we're gonna see how we all kind of go on this journey together. So um, Kim Kerrigan, unless you're really, really super young, there might only be one or two people in here that probably don't know who Kim is, one of the most iconic figures in Boston television forever. I mean, just who does not love Kim Kerrigan? When she comes to opening nights, the men that I hang out with have a heart attack. They're like, can I meet her? She was my crush. And um, anyway, she has just had an amazing career on Channel 7 and then on um, HDH, uh, Fox 25. She's, I, I did her podcast a few months ago, Kerrigan and Company, and, and Dave Thompson is here who helps produce that and um, just a dynamic interviewer, so natural in her style. And um, so we're gonna, I think I'll start with you, Kim, and we'll talk a little bit about your um, life. And I always like to say where people are from. She was born in Missouri and then spent some years in Des Moines with her husband and then moved to the Boston market. So tell us a little bit about what, it, it was funny when we were talking, I said, why did you get into, um, media relations and whatnot, and you actually wanted to be in sports, but they kind of talked you out of it. So think about it, a couple of decades ago, there were no women in sports, right? It, it was just a decade ago. Yeah. Oh, I was. <laughs> First off, thank you very much for having me here today. What a delight. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, Karen uh, is a fabulous moderator, and I'm so glad she's here. It is very difficult for me to be on this side. It seems very <laughs> strange. I am usually the interviewer, not the interviewee. Um, I got into broadcasting when I went away to journalism school because I went to be a sportscaster. My father was a huge sports fan, and uh, I am the oldest of two daughters, so somebody had to carry something for him. So I said that I would be the one. I went to the University of Missouri Journalism School, and a very, very smart and brave uh, counselor, who was a man, by the way, stepped up and said to me, as I went into my junior year, I really hope that you'll broaden your horizons and think about news as well, because at that stage of the game, it was gonna be very difficult as a woman to find a job in sports, because there were so few women who were doing sports, and certainly not local sports. So, um, you know, against my father's wishes, I did broaden my horizons, and thus there's my story. So, uh, I, I always, you know me, I love to like give some dirt on, on people's careers and whatnot, and one of the things I was dying to ask Kim, because I remembered when you went from Channel 7 and then um, to, is it CBS and then to Fox, but at one of these jobs, I remember this story so vividly. She was seven months pregnant and got let go. And I remember being like, oh my God, what are the repercussions of this? And I've always wanted to hear her tell that story. So talk to us about that story. Yeah, so um, I was at Channel 7 at the time. I don't know how many of you remember. Um, and uh, we were that, you know, rough and tumble station that everybody said would change media forever. And um, I was in my third contract with them, and I was pregnant with my youngest, Gracie. Um, I was, oh, actually, I take that back. I was pregnant with my oldest, um, AJ. And, um, and I was up for renewal, and my agent out of New York was opening up contract negotiations. We were, not, we were at must -see NBC, must-see TV. We were number one um, in our programming. 
we had beat Natalie and Chet for the first time, which was such a big deal. Um, they had just done uh, a Q rating on anchors in the marketplace, knowing that this contract negotiation was coming up, and I was number one. So I thought I was in great shape. And on a Monday morning in early May, my agent called me and said, um, Kim, you don't need to go into work today. And in fact, you don't need to ever go back there again. And I, I, I spoke incorrectly. I was pregnant with my daughter. She was born in June, so this was May. So I was that big pregnant. And, um, and it started from there. And uh, there was no excuse for it, except that they just didn't want to pay the kind of money that I was prepared to uh, sign a contract for. And it got very ugly and very, uh, very drawn out. My agent did everything he could to protect me, but before we knew it, we got a cease and desist, so we couldn't talk about it publicly. Um, they didn't want to settle, and there was still time on my contract. Ultimately, the New York Times called me and wrote a front page article about a woman who was number one in the market and was pregnant and was let go. Um, and it became a very ugly, nasty uh, story. The, the bottom line, in the end, was um, that they did pay out. And the day that it happened, CBS called me to ask me if I would come across town. Uh, the problem was that uh, the management wanted to hold me to a non-compete after they had let me go and didn't want to renew. So um, that's where we got into some real legal battles and, and um, it was it was a tough situation. I went ahead and had a baby. I just decided, yeah, I think I'll just go ahead and do that. <laughs> At least get that behind me. Um, and so I, I did go ahead and have Grace and we did uh, finally get it settled. And then ultimately I did go across town to, uh, to CBS. But, uh, yeah, it was a very nasty, mm. interesting time. And, and you, she said to me yesterday when we were pre-interviewing, she said that both times you had a baby, you kind of walked off that day and then immediately had a baby, like within a day or, or so, and then back to work six weeks later. I, I left the station both pregnancy, well, not Gracie's pregnancy, I guess, I did not. Um, but I was, my intention was to walk out that day. But with my oldest, I left that day and had a baby the next morning. Mm. And then six weeks later, I was sitting right back in that chair. That could have made for interesting news. Film at 11, yeah, Kim Kerrigan, absolutely. water breaks in the middle of her broadcast. <laughs> Thank goodness that was not part of my story. I have enough story to be told. Uh, yeah, but. So, um, it, and back then, was the pressure as intense just about being youthful on, on the air and whatnot? Were people get, getting, like, because Natalie Jacobs, Jacobs or Jacobson? It lasted a long time, like amazingly. Well, it's funny that you would say that because I will tell you that in both situations with my kids, I went back six weeks um, later. So after I had Grace in June, I went to work for CBS um, mid-August. And in both situations, I was frantic to get back down to my size mm. that I was prior to the babies. Um, with Gracie, CBS was going to shoot billboards and they wanted me to be back in shape before we shot those billboards so that they wouldn't have to reshoot them again after I lost the weight. Mm. So I think that might give you an indication of what the pressure that you felt It's was. amazing, amazing. So since we're in an election year, I, I just want you to tell a couple of quick stories. I was asking her, you know, the obvious questions. Who's the most famous person you've interviewed? What's the craziest thing that's ever happened in an interview? Tell them the, the Barbara Bush story. Well, I see Dave laughing because I've, Dave teaches and sometimes I go and speak to his classes and tell this story. Um, so I worked in Des Moines, Iowa before I came here to Boston. And I worked in Des Moines during uh, the election year when the Bushes were running for a second time. So of course there was the Iowa caucuses in February and Mrs. Bush invited me, I was, a, I was an anchor there as well, Mrs. Bush invited me and a crew to come to Washington to spend a day with her. So uh, we flew to Washington and I met her at a school at, across, uh, you know, someplace in DC and she was reading to kids and then we went back to the White House. And then amazingly enough, which I'm the only person that I know who's ever done this, she invited me and one of my photographers upstairs 
to have a tuna fish sandwich in the private quarters. So I actually have been to the private quarters and we sat in the kitchen and she made tuna fish and we had this great lunch and uh, I went with her then to a fundraiser and then flew back to Des Moines. Um, so now you fast forward to November and they're behind and it's election day. And I got a call the night before from her people saying, would you have interest in um, interviewing Mrs. Bush tomorrow morning? And I said, well, of course. So I was there bright and early. We were ready to go. And Mrs. Bush came in and she gave me a peck on my cheek and she sat down across from me and the light went on. And I said, Mrs. Bush, and she started talking and talking and talking and talking. And I would go, and she talked right over the top of me. And I, I, of course, kept trying to get in. All of her people are behind her staring at me like, don't you dare, little lady. Do not speak. Yeah. <laughs> and I would try to get in, and then it started to get rude on my part. And of course, she was the first lady. So it wasn't as if it was just somebody out on a campaign trail. So it came to an end, and I never had an opportunity to ask her any questions at all. And the light went off, and I sat there dumbfounded, and she stood up, and she took her mic off, and she reached across, and she took hold of my hand, and she said, I'm so sorry, honey. And she turned and she walked out. Wow. 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 Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, and I said, what was it like when you went back to the studio? Like, you know, did they crucify you over it? I mean, what can you do in a situation right. like that, really? Right. You know, she, she was going to play whoever it was. And she probably thought, oh, this nice, sweet girl that I had this wonderful interview with, I can probably control that. Not, you know, and, and I've seen this done before. It, not very often, but that, what a situation for you to be in. I think if I had been now or if I had been 10 years later because I was pretty young, I think I would have put the mic down and stood up and walked out. Ooh, that would have been a I've statement. I've thought about that many times. I think I would have been the one who would have said, well, nope, we're done. So before we, we move on, I, I just, we have to do one more political story. Tell the uh, Bill Clinton story. <laughs> <laughs> so classic. <laughs> <laughs> so in that same station when I worked in Des Moines, um, we had terrible, terrible floods uh, that hit the state in uh, the middle of the summer. and. Bill Clinton was in office, and so the president flew to Des Moines um, to, to survey the damage because, you know, acres and acres and miles and miles of crops were underwater, and it was July, so it was just about harvest time. So he came to determine how much aid he would send to the state. And he was going to be on a radio station there, and I was sent over to cover this interview with him. So um, I went upstairs and they told me to go up and go through the door at the top of the stairs. The president would ultimately come in and go into a radio st studio and I could stand outside of the radio studio and my crew could come around the other direction and watch. So I went up the stairs and I saw the door and I opened the door and I stepped in. And it was a hallway with a locked door behind me and a locked door on the other side. And about 30 seconds later, that door opened, in walked the president, and the door shut behind him. And there we were, locked into the airlock <laughs> together. I looked at him, I said, Mr. President. <laughs> and he said, ma'am. He, he, he had a real southern accent when he spoke in person. And he walked right across the hall, and he stood there, and it was just the two of us. And we stayed in there at that airlock for about 20 minutes. The Secret Service thought they had him in a secure place, not knowing that I had come through the door on the other end. <laughs> Luckily, that was still secured, but, um, you know, I, I stood there, and I, to this day, I can remember very clearly he was wearing Wrangler jeans and work boots and a denim shirt, and he had something in his pocket, and he had a Band-Aid on his finger. <laughs> now, I mean, these are the, the things you, that you sort of take in, right? when you're standing there with the president alone and not really anticipating that that is what would happen. But he was quite charming, and he is a close talker. And um, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I love that story. Um, and, and I should say, Kim is a um, North Shore gal now. She lives in Swampscott with her husband, who's a doll. I've met him many times. And uh, speaking of whose, whose husbands are a doll, Donna Holliday, for those of you who don't know, former mayor of Newburyport, having um, 
held the office for 12 years during COVID, during a really difficult time. Her husband is Joe Holiday, who was the bass player for The Fools. And did I hear that? Did you say to someone that he just got inducted into the New England Music Hall of Fame or something? Or? I did last Sunday oh, night good, at, good the, for him. at the Ipswich Castle. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. Congratulations. I just met him actually a couple weeks ago at the Berry Tavern. Great guy. So Donna has been just an, an amazing public servant, like whether it's in government or in agencies helping um, the disabled or mentally ill or wh whatever it is that she's done. And I said to her, talk about like where, we always wonder where people that are just devoted their entire life in, in no matter what job they do. You grew up in Marblehead, yes. live in New Report now, mm -hmm. but what, you were talking about where you thought that inspiration came from. Well, I think it really came from my mom uh, because she, was very, very engaged in volunteer work. And you know, when you used to be able to walk up and down the streets and collecting for muscular dystrophy, you know, we used to do these campaigns that you know, the whole approach is very different now that it's online, but and that's where it began. And then also being a Girl Scout, you know, you do a lot of volunteer work. And so it all sort of started from there, I, I believe in terms of, of learning about people with disabilities, learning about people who were less fortunate than others and finding ways to step out and, and help in a variety of ways, whether that was you know, a local home, uh, entertaining residents at a nursing home or going to an institution and, and helping to feed and support individuals with severe disabilities. And so that's where I think I, the, the mm -hmm. grain was, was placed. You gave me a flashback of the night before Thanksgiving, my mom would have the little silver foils every inch of the kitchen. There'd be 30 or 40 of them with a frozen turkey and she'd put all the fixings and then we would go deliver them in the station wagon together. And I guess it's like when you see that as a child, it really, it's in your heart, right? And you right. can't help but, but go forward with it in your life. Um, Donna has so many degrees. She's, she has a couple of, of um, masters, and she has a. Then she decided oh, a few years ago just to go back to law school, you know, just because she could. And, um, and so very educated. And, and your family was, was, you know, were academics as well, right? Dad was that was probably some of the. Was he? Did you, was your was your, your dad really. that was a neuroscientist? Um, no, my dad uh, went to UMass and was a nuclear engineer. Nuclear engineer. And uh, he was down in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. If you ever see those new reels of yesteryear where they were trying to create a nuclear engine down in Tennessee, which failed miserably. And my mother couldn't wait to get us back to Massachusetts because of what was going on with the Ku Klux Klan and burning crosses on people who lived down in Tennessee at that time. It was a very difficult time in uh, the uh, you know, late 50s. But anyway, she was very happy to get back to, to Massachusetts for sure. So my dad worked for GE for 40 years. He uh, was involved with helicopter engines. And my mom did the typical stay at home, volunteer, you know, do fundraisers for various organizations and drive us to everything that we possibly did. And uh, then she decided on her own that she was gonna go back to school and got her degree in gerontology, which was mm -hmm. wonderful. I was so proud of her. Yeah. Wow. And one of the common denominators with women on leadership panels is always mentoring. And when you were mayor, I mean, you, you spun off quite a few people into town manager positions. Talk a little bit about that and just... Yeah, that was, it was sort of a surprise to me, but then all of a sudden it became, I understand, because I work very hard. I expect a lot of staff, right, Donna, where are you? Uh, <laughs> she was my chief of staff for uh, the final years of um, my term as mayor, but I kept having to hire a uh, new chief of staffs because they kept being snatched up. My first chief of staff, uh, he was, he amazed me. He's now the town manager in Andover and has done a fabulous job, uh, Andrew Flanagan. But, you know, he was the same age as my youngest son and I just couldn't believe what this young man knew about politics at such an early age. He said, where did this come from? He said, well, I started making my own political signs when I was eight. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, but uh, he was fabulous. And then he went on to uh, assistant town manager in Arlington and then on to, um, Andover, and then uh, another town manager in Brewster, down the Cape, um, and uh, Boxford, uh, Matt Coogan, so Peter Lombardi and Matt Coogan. So um, people really wanted my staff, and when I would go to events like this, I, if it was a political event, I said, just keep away from my chief staff. <laughs> because there, there's so much to learn when you take on jobs like that, and uh, you don't want people turning over very quickly, so you try to support, mentor, encourage them, let them grow and learn, and hope they stay for a few years with you, that's mm. for sure. 
But um, mentoring is really important, I think, when you're in a leadership role um, because you want to raise up the people who are coming behind you and help them grow and develop and, you know, encourage students. That was something that was really important to me, too. Um, to write letters of recommendation, to meet with them, to talk about their interests, their careers, what they wanted to do, support career fairs at school. And one of the things that I started, which I thought went over far better than I ever thought it would, was to bring students into City Hall, give them a tour, mm -hmm. and then do mock City Council's meeting. Because there's you know, a difference between town select people and um, town managers or administrators, and then you have um, mayors with city councilors. And that surprised me initially because, uh, just a little aside, people would ask me when I was first elected, are you a strong mayor? Well, of course I'm a strong mayor. <laughs> but I, understanding that places like Worcester, Lowell, they have mayors in Cambridge, but they are elected from the top vote getter of the city council. So it's like a city council president. It's not really a mayor, per se, uh, but they have the title. So anyway, so I invited all these students to come, different grades, into City Hall and would do mock city council meetings with them. And so they got a chance to really see firsthand what it was like to be engaged in making decisions about the places where you live. And uh, that went over really well. And people still stop me today who are older and say, why did this on your city council thing? <laughs> and, and so it's really nice to develop those kinds of relationships that last a long time. And when, when she was mayor, she had a city council with 11 men on it. So that could not have been easy. I think it's more diverse now. Oh, right? much more diverse. It was one term, because uh, the mayor was initially two years, and then we changed our charter. So I did two two-year terms, and then I did two four-year terms. Um, and so um, the council still is two years, and that one term during the course of that 12 years I was mayor, I had 11 men. No <laughs> offense. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was very challenging. It was incre incredibly challenging. In fact, one of the counselors who ultimately tried to take me down as mayor and lost, significant, so. um, he at one point uh, changed the council rules and said, because I was the first mayor to actually come into a city council meeting and give updates to the council. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, you had to be invited in by the council. And I said, stop, this is nonsense. You need to know what's going on. And so then, they told me, you will sit there and you have seven minutes to speak. You gotta think about it, right? <laughs> Just like a good mom. And, and you know, all of us love Newburyport, right? And so much of what we love about Newburyport is because of what Donna did. You, you had some challenging years there. She handled the whole Whittier Bridge construction project, all of the, the sewers out to Plum Island. But she started the boardwalk. How many people know the boardwalk like along the riverway? You started that, and I think you're, yeah, I mean. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, talk about that a little bit. So, you know, I was on the council for two terms, but the, you know, looking at the infrastructure needs, we were losing our clear well, which was affecting our water supply. Our, we we're losing our sewer plan. 38% of our elementary school kids were being educated in moldy trailers hanging off of an elementary school. We couldn't have computers in one school because we didn't have enough electricity. Uh, we, our track was condemned. Our, uh, I mean, I could go on and on. Our seniors who were, um, our senior um, director of senior services worked out of essentially in a closet out of the Salvation Army and 22 satellite sites for seniors, which is really conducive to you know, building community, you have to go do yoga over here, then you have to go do bingo over here, then lunches over here. It was crazy. So we really needed a senior center. So I'm really proud if you've ever come to Newburyport, it's where the old Bresnahan School used to be. It's a five-star, beautiful, beautiful senior center, and our seniors love it. So that was a, a really important piece. Um, also the fact that um, our schools, we did um, a new elementary school, we built a uh, revised a middle school, which had an upper elementary with it, uh, which was so important to the community. And then, you know, all of these changes that occurred, uh, bringing water and sewer out to Plum Island, which started before me, and then there was a big disaster there, but we won't talk about that. So, <laughs> it was like, you have a big engineering firm out of Cambridge who uses all the wrong materials in a, sal you know, uh, a saline environment with the ocean, and it was just, so it was a 
about a three and a half year suit against them, but people say, you'll never be this big engineering firm. I did. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we were able to replace all the hydrants out of Plum Island that were starting to tilt over. It was just, you know, these are the kinds of things you inherit uh, oftentimes when you take office. So tons of infrastructure work, really, really proud of everything we did there. But uh, one of the things that was, um, I'll tell, because she, um, Karen mentioned about the Whittier Bridge project. This is sort of a funny story. I was um, working with all these guys for years as the you know design, build, you know what it was going to look like, materials, uh, sound testing, working with the residents in Amesbury, Salisbury, and Newburyport. It's a huge project. Uh, you know, it was a uh, four hundred million dollar federal project to rebuild the Whittier Bridge, and you know, so we go through years and years of all this work and. All of a sudden, we're down to the color. And the guys want, you know, that rusty brown that you see on a lot of things? That's not, that's new. But it looks really, I said, we're going to spend $400 million and we're going to make it look like it's going to fall down. You know, this doesn't make any sense to me. So you have the choice of that rusty brown or that puke green is what I call it, that you see everywhere, right? And so, or this was a new color they introduced, which is blue. And of course, everyone's wearing blue today. So blue is the color. So they were, um, you know, they were going back and forth, and I, I was adamant, we are not making that bridge brown. So we fi they finally agreed, deferred to Donna, and Governor Baker shows up, and they tell the story, and he says, well, of course you listen to the woman when you pick the color. And now you have Donna Blue. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Don. We're going to come back to you in a little bit. I, I want to now introduce Suzanne Ayavana, who's the president and CEO of Pride Motor Group. And I have been dying to meet Suzanne for a long time because I know her story. And, you know, when you look at her bio, it, it starts out with October 19th, 2014, a day Suzanne Ayavana will never forget. And that was the day that, um, and this is like a real marker moment in her lifetime, when her husband Michael died in a car accident. And I knew, her, I was telling her this story yesterday, I knew her husband Michael, when I was at Comcast years ago, I used to have to host the suite a lot at the Red Sox games, at the Bruins, Celtics, all that. So one night I'm with my late husband in the, um, in the Red Sox uh, suite, and Michael, we call him Mikey I, was there and he says, Karen, you know, a couple of my friends over at the Green Monster, you know, can I invite them over? I said, you know, sure, like we're not supposed to do that, we get in trouble if we have too many people, but fine. Well, he brought in the entire Bruins team. And it was, it was Steven's birthday and the entire Bruins team sang happy birthday to Steven. Steven's like, this is the best birthday ever. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so he was a character. But um, um, he, so obviously there, the, he gets into this horrible car accident and dies, and Suzanne, who was not, you weren't really in, involved in the business per, so much. So let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about when you were a hygienist and moving into um, the world as a periodontal surgical assistant. Let's take it back to that first, and then we're gonna tie this all together. Yes, yeah, so since the age of seven, I knew I wanted to be a dental hygienist, which is probably weird to most people, but um, <laughs> my aunt's sister-in-law was one, and every time I would get my teeth cleaned, I'm like, I can't wait to grow up and be you, and <laughs> you know, my friends were like, you're a little odd, but okay, and um, so I couldn't wait, and I went to this little school called Westbrook College in Portland, Maine. There was only like 20 of us in the class, and... Um, before I went there, I was a very shy student. I didn't have um, a great, I just never thought of myself as anything. And I met my roommate, and she was just like this boisterous, you know, energetic, bubbly person. And so she kind of brought me out of my shell in the first level. And so then um, when it was time to graduate, every year, a doctor from Paraco PC in Swampscott would come up to the college and recruit some hygienists because at the time I think we had about 30 of them and due to pregnancy or whatever they always needed to recruit some uh, new hygienists so I was like I need to get this job I want to work there and luckily I did uh, with two other girls and that was my only job as a hygienist so when you work there you're first a hygienist and then you are maybe given the opportunity to be a surgical assistant. So after five years being there, the surgical assistant with one of the doctors, Dr. Nevins, 
became pregnant for the second time, and she said, I really think Suzanne is up for this. I want to, you know, promote her. So he came to me, and I was thrilled, but I'm like, yeah, I really kind of faint at the sight of blood. It's okay. <laughs> teeth, but, you know, periodontal surgery is a little bit more than just a little bleeding. So the first time I was with Dr. Reiser, and I... Um, was watching his surgery, and sure enough, in a few minutes, I went down. <laughs> and I'm like, they brought me to, and they're like, come on, you gotta do this again. I'm like, I don't think this is for me. Yeah. <laughs> You'll check it tonight. So then I went back again. Gail's like, come on, you have to go, right? So the second time, again, I fell. I fainted, right? And I'm like, guys, this, I just don't think I can do this. And they're like, yes, you can. We know you're gonna be great for the job. So. Long story short, 15 years later, I was uh, Dr. Nevin's assistant. And it was such a big dental practice that we, they wrote books and gave lectures everywhere, but also um, doctors from other countries would come and watch us. And so the German doctors came and they said to Dr. Nevins, do you think she'll come with you on one of these trips? And he's like, yeah, sure, I can ask. So I got to go over and teach other, um, they don't really have any formal hygiene school, so I got to teach the girls there. We did live surgery, and then after the live surgery, I would explain to them, you know, how you set up, how you assist the doctor. So it was the best time of my life because I was the only hygienist slash assistant that ever got picked to go to Europe. So mm. I got to go to Italy and then back to Germany, so it was a great experience. And um, I had my son at the time, he's 30 now, but my mom took care of him, so I was still, you know, going uh, from country to country with him. And then I became pregnant with my daughter five years later. And because my husband was running the car dealership um, with his parents, he's like, I think you're gonna have to be a stay-at-home mom, you know? You just can't keep going to Europe and, and, and doing this kind of stuff. So I'm like, all right, so. I can? Yeah. <laughs> So like Kim, I worked up to the day I delivered. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I have to go. <laughs> um, and so then I was a stay-at-home mom for 14 years. My daughter was 14 when my husband passed away, and my son was um, 19. Uh, she was a figure skater, so we were up in uh, Vermont at the time when they called me. And my son was in Canada. He got to go to, he was, um, recruited by UMass Amherst to play hockey. So they wanted him to do a gap year, so he was up there. My daughter was then finding a partner, which turned out to be in Italy, so she was gonna be traveling. So it was a lot um, going on um, when he passed. So that day was the first and last day I felt sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. It was a night of fetal position, and, but I knew I had two children to take care of. So. So one of the things that um, Suzanne mentioned was that she was a very shy kid. And one of the things that I'm fascinated with is, you know, when you go through things like Suzanne and I have been through, you know, you say all the, t I, I remember saying to my grief counselor, we talked about this yesterday, where do you get the strength? Like, where does it come from? And it's because we've had so many, all of us have had so many hard knocks from a very young age. And to, to because we're gonna talk about how successful the business is now, I wanna go backwards though, to show where you came from. So dad was a manic depressive. You had a brother who was special needs that mom is scrambling to take care of. And you're there kind of in the shadows. On top of that, I would talk a little bit about the alcoholic teachers that, that you know, that you just, you don't know the stuff that goes on in schools when people are growing up. And so tell that story, because yeah, I was fascinated so by it. in third grade and in the fourth grade, I had two teachers that were alcoholics, and they would hide their nips in the, you know, in the drawers. And I had my best friend, she sat next to me on the left, and another girl sat next, in front of me. And they were smarter than me and prettier than me. And every day, the teacher couldn't wait to say, oh, Suzanne, why isn't your hair thick like Debbie's? Or why can't you get the grades Can you, imagine? you know, that Judy got? And you know, even though she was my best friend, I was always intimidated and just always felt that I'm never gonna to amount to anything. I'm always just kinda, you know, I am what I am. And, and um, so it was very difficult. So that was, you know, going through high school, I was very, very shy. I was on the track team and stuff. And 
but I never really, I was just there, right? Mm. Um, and so, like I said, it was very difficult till I got to college and met my roommate. Like I said, she got me out of my first little, you know, uh, shell. But it was difficult growing up with my dad. He um, had managed to press it very bad, and back then no one talked about mental illness. So he really didn't get the help he could have gotten today. And it was very difficult for my mom. So I never really wanted to burden her, especially with my brother as well, saying, you know, what about me? I'm not, you know, I'm having trouble as well. So I just kept everything inside of me. And then my sister was born nine years young, um, later. And I just felt, well, I'm gonna be the mom that, my mom was a great mom, but you know, certain things that I was missing I'm going to give this to my sister. So it was like I was um, a mom at uh, 10 years old. Um, yep. But yep, too often we have to grow up too, yeah. too early, right? We become the parents. Mm -hmm. So then you, you have to inherit. And your in-laws had already passed when, when Michael died, right? Yeah, so in so, 2004, my mother-in-law passed. Then three years later, my father-in-law passed. My mother-in-law passed of cancer. And then four years, my father-in-law had a stroke. And my husband was an only child, and he had a very difficult time once they, they died to go into work to deal with anything because they were around each other 24-7. If we go out to dinner, it was, okay, two of them were mad at one. You know, it was like always that type of thing. And I was kind of left on the sidelines, but it was fine. Um, I had my son, and we would do our own thing. But they never wanted me involved in the business because they knew how stressful it was. Plus, I was a hygienist, and I never wanted, you know, I went to school for science, not math. Math was not my forte then. Now it's a different story, but, um, <laughs> but back then, so. But, so then you have to go into the dealership, and I want you to talk about some, what that was like. As there, there were, I had heard a story about a number of male dealers in the region that basically went in and were like, you can't handle this. You better just sell this to me right now. You're going to fail. On top of that, you have a partner, your husband's late partner, business partner, who's deceitful. And let's talk about how you had to navigate all of that and what you were up against and how you survived it. Uh, first, I want to apologize because I can go on on a tangent. So if I just, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. like, <laughs> but um, anyway, so like I said, I was in Vermont the day he passed and the partner, so when my in-laws passed, like I said, he was in a, in a depression. He didn't you know, want to go to work. I'm like, you got to go to work. You got to find out what's going on. And so we would just push him out the door. And then one day, my son was out with him after hockey practice. And he bumped into this guy that my father in law actually gave his first job to. And he was leaving Herb Chambers. And he's like, Michael, do you have a job for me? He's like, better yet, I have a better op you know, proposal for you. And kind of wrote on a napkin that if you make, make me X amount of dollars, I'll give you 10% of the business. But that's how it was on a nap. So he kind of came out of his funk a bit. But that day that he passed, the partner called me and said, hey, are you coming home? And I said, he just passed five minutes ago. I have 30 skaters, 10 coaches in, in my hotel room. I'm not going anywhere. And nothing like, I'm sorry, I miss my friend. This guy was great to me. We, you know, it was like, no, we need to come up and get you. So I'm like, I'm not coming. 10 minutes later, he called back again asking me. I'm like, I'm not coming. I'm, I'm not coming back. So finally, my, my girlfriend got on the phone, and then the lawyer started calling, who I thought was our friend that we used to vacation with, and turned out that he was in cahoots with him on the day my husband died. So him, he was calling. His wife was calling. They were going to you know, um, have a limo, plane, train, automobile, anything to get me back. So the reason why they wanted me back was I own three dealerships, Pride Kia, Pride Hyundai, and Pride Chevy. And at the time, my husband's like, I'm going to go back to work because we're going to buy another dealership um, up in Salisbury, and I'm going to have to start working there. And um, so the day he passed, he was supposed to sign the papers over saying that we're getting this dealership. The partner couldn't sign his name because the partner had gone through a bad divorce and he couldn't, they, the manufacturer wouldn't allow him to become a part of the dealership. So the only way that dealership was going to happen was my husband's signature 
And later I found out that my general manager at the time signed his name. Hmm. So that was the first part. And, but again, you're like trying to deal with the death of your husband, your two children. I had to call my son from Canada. You know, he's <clears throat> passing out. It was just, there was just so much going on. So the first year after he passed, I really didn't go in there because I had to deal with lawyers and who was going to take over and how much percentage is owned to who and my kids own some and it was just it was just a mess so i didn't get in there till a year over till a year had passed and at that time all hell had broken loose and he took that dealership over he told all my employees you work for me that's their you know pride is pride he named it pride he wasn't supposed to um he i bought everything in that dealership, unbeknownst to me, out of one of my dealerships. So when my employees got the checks, it was from me, not him. So that was part of the, the demise of, so for the first year, I um, almost went bankrupt just doing that. So. Mm. But then went to the National Automobile Dealers Association Academy, went into the intensive instruction in sales, service, finance, and earned your certification, and then went and just built, I don't want to say built an empire, but you brought everything back from basically the brink of destruction to profitable and successful again. Yeah, so um, Chevrolet didn't mind me coming dealer principal and Kia didn't, but Hyundai was like, well, you have no experience. You don't know anything, which was the honest to God's truth. And so they're like, well, you have to do these three things. I'm like, okay, what are they? They're like, you have to go to Korea. I'm like, okay, so I brought my son with me. And then the second thing is you have to um, join a 20 group, which is 20 men that get together four times a year, go around the United States, and just, we go over our financials. So they can help, you know, everybody guides each other. I'm like, okay, but at the time, it's all going over my head because I don't know anything. And the third thing was to go to the academy. So the first day I show up at the academy, I'm the oldest in the class, mostly. My son just graduated, so most dealers send their children. And from day one, you know, everyone had all this knowledge. Yeah, I've been in it for 10 years, 30 years, and I'm like, okay, this is like one year and one month, and I still don't know anything. So it, it was very difficult, mm. and, um, but it was the best thing I did. And so at first, it was very difficult. I would go to meetings, and my partner was still there. Till I bought him out and would tell all my employees don't talk to her if she if you talk to her I need to know what's going on and then I would go to these meetings and it would be you know like Chinese front end back end so I would stay every night till one in the morning and go on the computer and google everything so I would at least learn start to learn things and then go to these meetings and then Sometimes in the meetings, I would just stop and say you guys have to slow down if I told you to clean number eight would you and they're like no and I'm like, well, I don't know the front end from the back end, so you're going to have to slow it down for me. So, But what's amazing is that she didn't have a single person that she could rely on or trust in that process. But your instincts clearly brought you through it, and because you've done very well and are very respected now within the industry. And there are not a lot of female car dealership owners, so congratulations on that. All right, we're going to come back to everyone. Unless, did you have another thought? Because otherwise I'm going to move on to Linda just for, um, to keep us on time. Um, so Linda, every, Linda's a fixture here. We all know Linda, right? <laughs> and I put her also in, just in that category of selfless service. Um, and, you know, born and raised in Beverly and then moved to Danvers to take care of your mom when she was sick. But you worked for Salem 5 for a while and then went into IT for, I'm trying to remember how many years, but 28 years. Um, and then decided to make, um, to make a, a, a change and to go into real estate. And um, because you really wanted to be a part of the community, which is who you are. So talk a little bit about that transition. Tell, this, tell the IT, well I do want to tell the one story about the IT where you had a horrible boss. And um, what I like about this story is she left the company. Was that to take care of your mom for a bit? But then went back into it, even though she didn't really want to be in that world anymore for two years, just to prove 
that she could, and you excelled, right? And that's when you made the decision to go into Keller Williams, which you loved, and you, your sister-in-law was in, involved with Keller Williams, and I want you to talk about that whole period of, you know, Dana Farber and what you learned from that experience because it's a very public profile for you. Absolutely, thank you, Karen. <clears throat> I'm the chair of the Power of Women Committee for the Chamber, and I want to thank Karen for um, being our moderator. <clears throat> Excuse me. Karen has done this. This is the fourth time I've seen her do it, and she's amazing. And I, the the work she puts in prior to this event is what makes it so good. So I want to thank Karen for that. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And I do want to tell Donna, my, my dad was a GE lifer. He was there for 44 <laughs> years. And you may have been my hygienist at Perico. Uh, <laughs> I had lots of uh, dental work done, periodontal work done there back in probably when you were there. So um, I, had, I, I had a career with a very large um, information technology company that was first based out of Dallas, Texas, and then we merged with another company, so it moved to Orlando, Florida. I was a remote employee, so I serviced clients. I was an account manager, and I serviced clients all throughout New England, um, New York, and New Jersey. And my good friend Jan is here. I've known Jan since 1985, I believe. Jan and I worked together. Um, so I worked my way up through the ranks, and as I said, I was an account manager. And through all my entire career there, for the most part, I had some really excellent managers, some so-so managers, but um, at the very end, I probably had the worst manager ever. Um, this man was, I, I don't even have words to describe him. We had a team of about, I want to say there was about eight of us, and we were all remote. Everybody was in different parts of the East Coast, and we would have a call with him every Monday and instead of building us up and saying, okay, you know, what can I do for you? He berated us and it was, you know, what, could, what have you done for me lately? And he would, instead of pulling people aside and saying, you know, you did this wrong or whatever, it, he would embarrass people. And it was, it was the worst experience. But what happened was I was, um, it was in 2011 when I moved to Danvers and my mom and I moved in together following year, um, I could tell the handwriting was on the wall. He, he, he didn't like me. He didn't like me part, partly because I stood up to him. And I could see that one of my friends that had worked for him previously, he walked all over her. Every, every Monday it would be like, Maria, do this. Maria, do that. And I just, I, I wouldn't put up with that. And when Maria actually was diagnosed with breast cancer, he and I were on a business trip and I was driving and he was in the back seat and I heard him on the phone with her a week before she was going in for surgery, like giving her orders, do this, do that. And as soon as he hung up the phone, I, I started screaming at him. And I said, do you realize this woman is, is getting ready to have surgery for breast cancer? You need to find someone to help her and not be yelling at her. So of course, like I said, he, he didn't really care much for me. So, uh, um, so it was August of 2012. I actually, I was, I was struggling with caring for my mom and then I came down with whooping cough and it was just, it was a really bad time. And I actually did take, um, not a full-time, but like a part-time family leave. And so I was working part-time, but as soon as I came back, I was um, given a performance, um, a performance plan, and I knew then what was coming. And the plan he put me on, I don't think anybody could have accomplished what, what he was looking for me to do. So as soon as I got that, uh, we were going to have, I don't know, biweekly meetings with um, HR. So I found myself the best attorney I could find. I got this woman from Boston. She was amazing. And um, I didn't say anything to anybody. I just... Her and I went, you know, through the whole situation. So we played this game for like, I don't know, two months. And it finally got to the point where the um, woman from HR called me one day and said, 
um, you know, this really isn't going to work out, so this is what we're going to offer you. And they were offering me a package. And um, I said, okay, well, let me run that by my attorney. And as soon as I said that, she could not get off the phone fast enough. Um, so at that point, everything was turned over to the legal, legal department of the company. And um, it took another, I think, two months before I actually left. So I had, to, I had to stay there for two months, do my job, and pretend everything was okay. Um, so <laughs> I forgot to tell you this, Karen, it's that right before, right before I was going, my, it was going to be my last day, it was probably about two weeks before then, we had a, we had a bank in New York that um, we needed to do a presentation for. So it was him and I and two um, sales support people from Orlando, and so we're all in New York together. Oh, that was fun, um, <laughs> spending two days with him. So the second night we were there, we were at dinner, and it, it's kind of a small community um, for, in the IT industry for what we were doing. And so you knew a lot of people. And he and the two sales support people were, you know, gossiping and they were talking about different people and someone would bring up a name and he would go, yeah, I fired him. And I'm sitting there like knowing in a couple of weeks, I'm out of a job. Um, so it's, I, I could have crawled under the table, but I got up and I went to the restroom and when I came back, they had changed the subject. But um, as soon as I got back to the hotel, I emailed my attorney to let her know what had happened. And um, when I signed the um, separation, usually it's just between you and the, the company. He was actually named in the separation and he was not to speak of me <laughs> at all. So um, anyway, <clears throat> since I was out of work, I. And again, I was struggling, you know, trying to care for my mother. She was 87. She had dementia. Um, I decided I was just going to take some time off. So I took a year off. And then my mom was going into assisted living. And I said, okay, I need to get back to work. And as much as I really didn't want to go back into that industry, I'd really had enough of it. I, like Karen said, I wanted to prove that I could do it and I could do a good job. And I was hired by a competitor, and um, I, I felt like I had never left. But um, after about two years, I just, I just didn't have it in me to do it anymore. And meanwhile, my, my late sister-in-law was in treatment for breast cancer. She, was in, um, she had a very rare form of breast cancer, and she was diagnosed in 2007. And um, at the time, when she was getting ready to start treatment, her and my brother, they had two, two young boys. Um, it, was, it was a very chaotic situation, and they, they had no idea, like, who's going who's gonna to watch the boys? Who's going to take her to Dana-Farber? So I finally said, okay, I'll do it. I'm going to take you to Dana-Farber. I will be there every step of the way for whatever you need, treatment, doctor appointment, whatever. And um, that way my brother could be home with the boys. I thought that was very important. So... Um, my sister-in-law was an agent with Keller Williams, and um, she was sitting. She would be sitting in treatment, getting chemo, and she'd be on the phone making deals. <laughs> mm. So I, I got to you know hear a lot about what she did, and it was something that always interested me. And my my brothers both were um, had been in real estate part time at one point. So I just decided that's it. I'm leaving, and I quit. <laughs> and uh, left, a, left a job that I was making pretty good money at and had benefits and uh, basically went to being unemployed. So um, I started with Keller Williams in 2016. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Real estate agents have to go through 40 hours of, of classroom before you can sit for an exam. And then you sit for the exam and then they give you your license. Guess what? You don't know anything. And um, it, it's like drinking out of a fire hose when you first start. There's just so many aspects to it. So um, I don't think Michelle knows this, but she was one of my very first clients. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle was referred to me by another agent and, um, and another brokerage, actually. It was um, someone I knew, and um, he 
he said, why don't you help out Michelle? And I, it was Michelle and a few other folks, but um, that was probably the best thing I ever did was making that, making that change. And the, the next best thing that I did was join this chamber. Um, hmm. I, <laughs> when I first joined, um, the first couple of years, I'm sorry, what? No, <laughs> no well, I'm, I'm, get ready there, Leslie. Um, the first couple of years, I really wasn't that involved, and I was wondering, you know, what am I getting out of this? And then um, it finally dawned on me, you get out of it what you put into it. And um, so about that same time when I started to really get involved, that's when Leslie took over. And um, I think everyone knows how fantastic Leslie is. And um, so I've been able to um, chair this committee, the Power of Women Committee, uh, get involved in the community. And um, I'm also a member of the board of the, the chamber and I'm a board member on the Beverly Rotary Club. One of the things, Linda, that, um, and you are an amazing community servant, and one of the things that I love, though, with regards to your story with Maureen, your sister-in-law, I mean, she basically took her for however many months, right? To it her, wasn't months, it was six years. Six years to every treatment so that her brother could be home with the kids. And, um, and, and you've now probably raised, what, like $150,000 in her name? Um, one hundred and eighty, hundred and eighty thousand dollars. We so back in twenty, twenty twelve, um, a friend of Maureen's, her nine year old daughter, had passed away from neuroblastoma. Maureen is part of a, a group of women in Amesbury called Tough Warrior and Princesses, and it's a group of um, breast not well. It initially, was breast cancer survivors, but now it's they support anybody who has cancer. So um, Maureen decided we needed to do something to honor Emma. So she started a team to do the Jimmy Fund Walk, and it was only two weeks away. So we raised about $16,000. Maureen passed away of April 2013. So I stayed with that team the following year, but in 2014, I wanted to do something in her name and, and to honor her. So I started my own team, um, which is... Maureen and Patrick's Troopers, and my good friend Jan, um, the Patrick and Patrick's Troopers is for Jan's brother Patrick, who passed away from cancer as well. So um, since 2014, we have raised over $180,000 for Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Mm. So if anybody is around on August 22nd, we're having a fundraiser <laughs> <laughs> at Giggles, and um, we're hoping to uh, get over 200000 this year. And one of the things that Linda said to me yesterday, you know, you, you remember that expression um, about the last time your name is ever going to be said, right? That's like so scary when you think about that. Who's the last person on the planet to remember you? And that's not what, what Lin, Linda mentioned yesterday. What she said was, I want to make sure she's never forgotten. I want to say her name. And I want all of us right now to say Maureen Turcott's name together. Maureen, Maureen Turcott. Turcott. Right? Yes. She'll, she shall not be forgotten. And she's, you are clearly, her legacy lives through you and her children, but through the beautiful work you're doing. And Maureen actually did some trials. You know, those trials oh. are really risky. And she knew in her lifetime, right, that they yes. weren't going to save her, but they are now in use. Yes, and um, I actually, so I really got to know her oncologist, Dr. Burstein, and um, she did. She volunteered for several, several trials, and some of the drugs that she, she was in trials for are in use today, and they're saving, saving lives. And the funny thing is, I, I go to Dana-Farber, don't go as often as I want to, but I go and I do donate platelets. And I was there, I don't know, two weeks ago, and I happened to be, I was walking down the hall back to the park, the elevator to the parking garage, and I, I don't know why, I sat down and there was a seat there and I sat down and all of a sudden I looked up and there was Dr. Burstein. Hmm. So um, got up, got a nice big hug from him. We keep in touch. Um, all of the funds we raise, go directly to Dr. Burstein. He is, um, he sees patients, but he's also a researcher at Harvard, so. Thank you for the work that you do, honestly. It's amazing. 
So I, I do want to, I, because these four women are also interesting, I do want to take a minute just to see if there's any burning questions that anyone has on uh, either the work they're doing or the dirt in their life that you were dying to know about. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. It's easy when you have great stories to tell. Yes, yeah, so after he passed, my girlfriends are like, just let um, Paul run the business. He'll write you a check. You won't have to worry. You can still play tennis with us because, you know, <laughs> prior to him passing, I, I call it like the she she life. You know, I played tennis four days a week, uh, uh, was with my kids all the time. And um, so now I had to put on a dress. I was usually in tennis sneakers and a skirt. And, um, so it was difficult because when I went in, no one was going to talk to me. But getting back, I knew if I sat home and collected a check, I knew the next day my kids and I would be penniless. And down the road, before I, I, got, I bought him out and found enough evidence, I found, I seized all the computer drives, and he actually wrote to his wife saying, don't worry, it's only going to take another month and she'll be out of here. So. It's, yeah, so I knew in the back of my mind that's how it always was going to go. It's not like my in-laws started that. He had nothing to do with it, nor did he come with anything. Um, but he was there at the right time when my husband needed somebody. So when I came in, um, having three dealerships, I had 100 employees. And not one was, you know, on my island. So um, it was very difficult, but... I couldn't fire a hundred people because I didn't even know what to look for. <laughs> um, the car business is like an octopus. There's a lot of le there's you know legs, and if they're not stealing from one aspect of the dealership, <laughs> they're stealing from another. So you know this is all going on, and you can. It's kind of like the mole game, right? You're putting one out. You're like, all right, I'm, I'm starting to learn this. I think, and then something else pops up. So it was basically. It'll be 10 years in October, and now is, the last two years is the first time that I can say, I think I have it under control. Mm. But you never have everything under control. Yes. Mm -hmm. I do know what you mean. <laughs> More than you may know. <laughs> that is a very kind thing for you to say. Thank you very much for saying that. Um, I have to tell you, you know, I love, and I know this is so cliche, but it really is true. I just like people. Uh, I'm a Midwesterner at heart, and so, you know, we Midwesterners maybe are a little bit different. I'll never forget when I first worked at Channel 7, I would walk up the street from the parking garage, and there was a police station, and they were always changing shifts, and I would always walk by and say, hey, guys, how are you? Finally, one day, one of the guys goes, you're not from here, are you? <laughs> like, wow, that's tough. Uh, but I, I appreciate you saying that. There's a lot of days you're so right, especially when I worked that morning shift. You know, I'd be out of bed at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I'd do four and a half hours of live television. And you can't fake that. You know, you have to keep that moving. Um, but um, again, it, it was just, it, it, I think a lot of it's out of gratitude. I look back on my life now, um, not that it's over by any stretch of the imagination, but the experiences that I've had, and I have been so incredibly blessed 
um, that that really does put a smile on my face each and every day. So thank you, though, for acknowledging that. I appreciate that. Well, and to that point, Kim said yesterday when I was uh, interviewing her, she said, I said, what, what haven't you done? And she really doesn't have any regrets right now or boxes unchecked. That's a life well lived yeah, when true. you can say that. Yeah. Very, right? very true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody over here, had, was it you, Joe? <laughs> You're talking to Linda or, or to uh, Suzanne? <laughs> no. So my lawyer was working with his lawyer. Yeah. So I did get the name changed on the dealership, but I got no nothing back. I, I actually had to pay him. Yeah. So. <laughs> I told them no male bashing at this. There are men in the room. <laughs> Robbing you, instigator. <laughs> yes, Leslie. Sure, absolutely. Yep, you got it. Any other questions? No other questions? All right, I want to close with, um, there's, I wish I had printed this out, but I'm going to read it from my phone. Um, and this is for all of you on the panel and for all of you in the room. And um, it's a piece that someone had framed and gave to me when I was going through a lot a few years ago. And um, it's called Chasing Light. And this is a little gift for all of you because um, men and women in the room, because it's all about chasing the light. She is unforgettable, a collector of light and grace, delicate yet a force of nature. She finds herself continuously rising beyond the storms that relentlessly arrive to break her. Among the unapologetic winds and piercing rain, she holds her ground, standing tall despite it all, planting seeds of faith in all the places that ache the most. Finding hope in her heartache and strength in her struggles, she keeps reaching for the sun, always moving toward the light even when giving up seems like the only option. Bold and vibrant, her power is unwavering. She knows that growth doesn't happen by avoiding the dark. It comes from finding light in the shadows, and in the shadows that fall, and that's her magic, finding beauty in what's broken, courageously following the direction of the sun, even when it's hiding. She is just like a sunflower, full of beauty, but made of strength, chasing light and standing firm, only standing in places where her heart can grow the most, emanating love and healing, she's always living her brightest life, radiating light to those who are in need of a little sun. So that's for all of you to keep chasing the light like these women have. Thank you for being here today. Thank you to Leslie and the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce. And Chris, thank, where's Chris? Thank you for the sound. Where are you? Thank you. Thanks for the two speakers this year, Chris. You're the best. So thank you. Everyone, feel free to mix and mingle for a little bit and do some networking. And uh, we'll see you all at the next event. Thank you. Woo!